Brothers and Sisters. Um, before we dive in, any questions, comments, thoughts, observations about our first service this morning? Captain, anyone else besides Captain? Uh, okay. Somebody else warned first, and then you come back. You wait your turn, Missy. <laughs> as far as predestination, uh, nobody's predestined to hell. Correct. As, as you disagree with the rest of Scripture. Exactly. And yet our human minds say when we're pre God predestined us, our human minds want to say, well, if some are predestined, then some must be predestined. And, and we know that's wrong, and yet our human minds want to take us there. So you're absolutely right. So we just, I, I just don't get caught up in that because our logic doesn't work with God's. Now, Kathy. Or, no, I'm Jane. All right, we're everybody but Kathy. Except that's in the Bible, so you're going to argue with God, not me. <laughs> And that gets kind of, and that whole question is, how come our, our human minds can't comprehend it? Because if, if he chose me, does that mean automatically he didn't choose someone else? Mm -hmm. And, and no, the answer is no, but our, our minds want us to tell us that, doesn't it? And, and that's where it gets hard. Now I've got to come back to Kathy because she's impatient. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where are we going? Yeah. <laughs> Don't know what's like to be saved. Okay, I can accept that. Um, yeah, Gia. Yeah. God knows how much better than the priesthood. Yep. And so he knows, as the Father knows the last day will be, he'll know how many or which particular individuals are trusting him alone as Savior. Yeah. So I suppose, I don't know. Yeah, we're. we're And yet, no one can be saved without the Holy Spirit, and, and God, the Holy Spirit, picks us. So, yeah. it, it kind of, our logic, our human minds are not capable of, of determining, making that kind of question. And so, we, and again, we're not, we're not asking any questions that Christianity hasn't asked for 2,000 years. Christianity has always stumbled on these questions because our human logic wants to answer these questions, and we can't. We are just limited into that. Um, and... The, the folly of our, our Christianity. That's why, you know, um, you know, the Bible says, have a faith like a child. A child doesn't get caught up in these questions. We just simply say, okay. Um, and that's where we have to fall in it. As soon as we try to figure them out and answer them, and, you know, now I got it, then we all run into all kinds of issues. Well, and a lot of you probably know I came over from the Reformed position, and I have read Calvin on that chapter on predestination in Institutes for Christian Religion, which is, by the way, Yeah. Uh, he said, 
Basically, I'm summing up. The destination is in there. Say thank you. And be very careful with it that you don't go chasing off into these rabbit trails. Because I saw that on the reform side, where people go over and beyond the predestination. I'm still learning through that as I come to a more of a Lutheran understanding of the faith. But I've seen people get lost in some really dark stuff like yeah. God actually rhymes with people. And one more yeah. thing. This predestination thing, even though it wasn't intended that way, can be used by Satan to wreak havoc upon conscience. Absolutely. Because we're, there's nothing in that, there's nothing if you go into double predestination, this is one of the downfalls of it. There's nothing that's stopping you from being Luther pre uh, his understanding of uh, Romans. Yep. There's, you're going to be down there, you're going to be confessing, and you're going to be wondering if it's enough, did I do enough? I guess I must not be elect, all that sort of thing. So, yeah, and yeah. that's it's just one of those things that we just have to kind of learn to live with this and say, let God be God. Um, and it's going to come up, and we just keep saying, yep, let God be God. So we're going to move on because we're not going to be able to answer this question. That's a good question, and it just keeps coming up. Um, any other questions, comments, or thoughts that aren't related to predestination <laughs> or election? <laughs> Um, I did want to, again, for those who are here and for those who, who are um, going to be in second service, just kind of remind you, um, we're doing something unique. I've never done this before, um, and I'm sure you know, maybe it's been done. Um, with Pastor Kevin down in Rhinebeck, our series on Ephesians that we're starting today, um, we decided we're both going to preach on the same text, but we're not going to preach the same sermon. So we're preaching through the book of Ephesians. Each week is a chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, through the six chapters of Ephesians. I have no idea what he said this morning. He has no idea what I said this morning. We simply said, you preach chapter one, I'll preach chapter one. And then after church today, uh, we're going to get together and we're going to create a podcast. We're going to talk about it and we're going to say, okay, what did you preach on and why did you choose this particular emphasis? Um, what was important? And then we're going to have that conversation for about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and then we're going to share this in the podcast and so that the, the members of both churches can kind of hear, how did your pastors come up with this particular emphasis? Because you could take Ephesians chapter 1 and you could preach probably 30 different sermons on that passage. Why did I preach the one I did on, on the emphasis on the fact that we were chosen and the fact that there are so many people that are, um, feel like lost? And, and why, where did I, why did I come emphasis the, the places that I did? And what did he say? So I think that's going to be an interesting conversation that we're going to have each week on the different chapters. Um, so you can read ahead what we're doing. If you want to listen to his sermon, it's, it'll be posted online. You can kind of listen to his and then, and then hear how we talk about the sermons and how we came up with it. That's the first phase. And then during the season of Lent on the Sundays, uh, we're going to try to do this, is we're going to actually get together um, and we're going to preach through the minor prophets. We're going to write one sermon and both preach it. Um, and see how is that preaching the same sermon to two different congregations and do the same thing get together afterwards and talk about it. okay you preach it to Emmanuel you know we and and the come the idea of writing one sermon is that two pastors preach uh, in two different congregations and just talk about this preaching idea of of the conversation where it comes from so it's something unique and different um, it, it may be a complete flop but it might be interesting for you to hear kind of what we go through and how we how we come up with it, it, don't laugh at it yet. Wait until it's done. <laughs> um, it might be interesting, at least, or at least for us pastors. Um, so the podcast is called Town and Country, uh, Two Churches, One Ministry. Um, so we just came up with that name, and, and we're going to start it, and who knows where it's going to go. Um, Kathy, again? Yes. Are you I kidding? Podcast. What's a podcast? I, I, I don't have no idea. I, I really, I, this is not, I'm not a podcaster. This is kind of a Kevin thing. Yeah, but isn't that, I mean, can't you do it on YouTube? You, it's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be, but it's just an audio. So it's just going to, there's no video. It's just be an audio. There's some graphics that John's going to put in, um, but it's just going to be a, an audio. You just listen to it. So you listen to it on YouTube or on, on the, the, the kind of like a radio program on your, on your YouTube or your face or your, the church's Facebook page or the church's website. Warren. Regarding Bible study, when will we get back to Gospel of John? Uh, as soon as we finish this, that's that's our plan. Yeah, I, I didn't know it was going to take us this long, but yeah, that's the plan is we're going to finish this. I thought this would take a week or two. I was wrong, which has never happened before. It's kind of strange. 
Um, but yeah, we are gonna, that's the plan to get back to John at that point. So any other comments, questions, thoughts, or observations? All right, I, I asked, oh. I'm sorry. No, yeah. Brief summary of the Epiphany service last night. Epiphany service last night. Um, I, it exceeded our expectations. Um, you know, doing this, the two congregations, we, uh, our goal was to have about 40 people, we thought. Um, we had 55 or 56 people come, which was fantastic. Um, uh, we uh, had divided up that I was going to focus on the giving of the gifts, the coming of the Magi. He was going to kind of focus on the Old Testament um, and the prophecies fulfilled and, and preaching that. And so um, with the, the soup supper afterwards, almost everyone stayed. Um, you guys were there. What were your observations for those who attended? Was it you know, was something worth doing? You think we should do it again? That was very good. I thought Pastor Kevin had a great message, and I thought it was good fellowship after the church. Yeah. Um, we did have at least one person from outside the two churches that joined us because we've been advertising and hoping to get that. So that was always so good. Uh, we want to keep doing it. So we will have another one of those services back at that same place for um, Ascension, Sun, uh, Ascension, which is on a Thursday. It's always on a Thursday. And that'll be sometime after Easter. I think it's in in April or May. Um, and so we'll do that again. So thank you. All right. I did give you an assignment last week because we finished the, the, the sacrament of baptism. We are now looking at the two-thirds sacrament of confession absolution. And I ask you to tell me all your deep, dark secrets. So let's hear it. All your deep, dark secret sins. We're going to confess. Come on. I know, Dave, you got a half dozen of them. Huh? <laughs> Kathy's first. <laughs> yeah. Where's your hand now, Kathy? Yeah. <laughs> I raised my hand too many times. You too many times. Yeah. Now, now you. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, confession is one of those wonderful uh, parts of the faith that we we really get to do because um, even the secular world understands that confession is good for the soul. Um, the truth will set you free. We hear this not in a biblical context. We hear this in a secular counseling context that, that confession is good for us. But confession is not in and of itself good for you. Confession, absent absolution, is meaningless. Yeah, it, it's just self-flagellation. It's self-destruction. It's just beating yourself up. Confession must, uh, for it to have any value at all, must come be accompanied by the absolution. Um, and so when, when we, we just shorten it from confession absolution to confession uh, only for, for shorthand, but we're talking about confession and absolution. Um, and in the church, when we talk about confession absolution, we talk about it um, as a sacramental action that takes place every Sunday. Uh, we do it in the, in the group setting of every Sunday, don't we? How do we begin after the invocation? What's one of the first things we do in almost every worship service? We do a public confession of our sins, right? I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what I've done, what I've left undone. I'm hardly sorry for sin. I sincerely repent of them. That is no less a sacramental kind of statement than if you were to do it in a private setting in a booth with a Catholic priest and behind the window, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. It is a confessional statement where I'm making my statement before God. The challenge with, with that, and I think where, where we have... Um, not shown it its um, value is that we do it so often and, and, and um, so frequently that maybe we forget the, the beauty of what we're asked doing. Sometimes I, I, I regret the fact that we don't slow down and really give thought to what we're saying. When we gather for worship in the, in the public nature of our confession, we are coming into the presence of the divine. This isn't just hanging out with one of our homeboy Jesus, JC. We are coming into the presence of the divine. And we are, before we can come into the presence of the divine, we are asking God to, to cleanse us, to make us worthy to stand. You know, and, and the image that we have is, is the, the Pharisee and the, the uh, publican in the, in the temple, right? And, and the publican's in the back saying, you know, I, I can't even come in here. I'm down on my face. And, you know, I, I have no right to even be in God. And the Pharisee's in the front going, oh, Lord, I'm so glad I'm not like that guy back there, man. I'm in here at church. I'm twice a week. And I, you know, I give half my money to you. And, 
Boy, I, you look at me, what a jerk. How, who, what right does he have to come in here to, to dirty this with his dirty clothes? And, and that's us in the back. And, and I don't know that we, we really give thought to the fact that that's exactly who we are. Because we, we just do it so often, we do it kind of out of rote sometimes, and we do it to get to the good stuff, to the readings or to the sermon or to the communion. Um, but if we were to slow down and think about it. Uh, when we confess something, does it matter if we just did it on our own or if you confess after you were caught doing something wrong? When I was a little kid, I did some wrong things. Like Let's hear about them. No. <laughs> I've got plenty. We'll wait. I know. Does it matter if you confess after you were caught or you just freely confess without being caught? Does yes and no. Yes and no. Um, because it, it doesn't matter about the timing. It matters about what's in your heart. What is your intent in your confession? Because if I'm confessing after I get caught so that I can minimize my punishment, it matters because you're just going through the motions. You're hoping to get off easier. You know, we, we all hear those guys who make confession in court, you know, make an apology to the judge so that they can get a lesser sentence. And if that's my, the reason my confession, yeah, it matters. But if you're really genuine and sincere in the fact you got caught, and, and sometimes I get caught because I needed to get caught, and I'm genuinely sorry, then it doesn't matter. Yeah, and I learned lessons yeah. from those experiences. Right. And, and so it probably didn't matter because it, it genuinely had the impact it needed to have in your life. So yeah, it's a yes and no. Uh, just real quick, I was thinking the example of uh, David getting caught by the flock of Nathan. Yep, so, yeah, in Bathsheba. Yeah, yeah. yeah and he, he didn't confess as I got caught, but his confession was genuine and sincere after he did, didn't it? Yeah. Um, so it really is, is kind of up to the individual and what your intent is behind it. So if we were to slow down and think about it, and so that's a challenge for each one of us. Um, is during that public confession, not just to say the words, but to, to generally use that time to think about the fact that I have sinned against you. And, and, and the things I say and things I do. Now, you don't have to have necessarily a list of, of things that you said, but sometimes maybe you do. You know, last night when I was arguing with my wife and I just said something, or when I, you know, talking to my boss, and I, and I know I could have given more to my work, and I just didn't give, or, you know, I was watching cable, you know, TV, and, and there was a program that I shouldn't have been on because it didn't respect the gift of marriage. Whatever it might be, yeah, that's a good time to, to give pause to that. Um, and, to, you know, we can do that. Um, and it's thought, words, and deeds, and we can do that. And I, I would love to, to give us more time to, to just think about it. Because I think sometimes we just go through the motions without. And, and the reason we do that is not to make us feel bad, although that, that's a byproduct. But because if we, if we just skim through that, then what value is the next phase? In the stand by the command, your sins are forgiven. Well, if you haven't really thought about your sins, then what does the absolution mean to you? Not that much either. If, if my sins aren't that bad, then the absolution isn't that great. So the deeper my sins and the more I give thought to my sins and the reality that I'm confessing really damnable stuff, the more great God's forgiveness becomes. And that's what it's all about, is the announcement of God's forgiveness. And, and we want that announcement to just lift us from the depths of hell and bring us to the brink of heaven. Um, and, and we lose that if our confession becomes just kind of a, you know what I mean? And so that, that's the challenge with the public confession absolution. Yeah. Kathy, now you're ready to spill your beans? Yeah. No, I was going to say, when, when I pray every day, I start out by thanking God for everything I have sinned of. And then I go through the things in there and, and help me realize where I have sinned. And yeah. That That's a powerful thing. So, and, and let, let me ask you this in all, in all seriousness, Kathy, and I appreciate it. That's a wonderful kind of a <laughs> reflection on your, your daily life and your prayer and your confession. 
what do you do after you finish that, that reflection of the Ten Commandments in terms of hearing the gospel? Okay, so that, there's the gospel that part. So it's important not just to confess that, but to, to recognize that after that, God has still forgiven and redeemed me. Right. Okay, that, that's the key. Uh, and that's what the value of confession is. That's the difference between a, a Lutheran confession and a Roman Catholic confession. Now, when, when we talk about confession generally in public, you see, I'm, I'm going to confession. Uh, most of our minds go to some sort of a Roman Catholic image of, of confession, right? When somebody says, I'm going to confession, that's the image we have. I'm going to go to a box, and there's going to be a priest behind a screen, and I'm going to say, Father, forgive me for I've sinned, right? That's kind of the image we have. Um, in Roman Catholicism, confession is just that. Um, once you have uh, acknowledged your, your sinful behavior, what's absent? The absolution. What you're given is acts of contrition. What you're given is you now have to pay for the sins that you've done. So once you've, you've confessed your sins, rather than hearing... Um, in the stead by the command, the Lord has forgiven you all your sins. Go and sin no more, which is what Christ says. What you said is, go and say five Hail Marys. Do acts of service. Do acts of mercy. Do acts of kindness. Give things. So you need to make up for your bad deeds. Uh, does that soothe the, the sore conscience, or does that put the burden back upon me to, to earn my right back towards God's goodwill? And, and that's really kind of a, a scary place to be in. And so what we want is that, that grace, yeah. Sure, I, I'm all for going to grace, you know, we do it um, with absolution and everything. Yeah. But does that mean, when we pray to God at night, or during the day, yeah. or whatever, we know God's going to forgive us. Absolutely. Because that's our sin. So I guess, do we get a public absolution, or do we talk about, you know, where's the gospel part of that? No. Like, you, you, you have it. You have that in your knowledge, and, and that's certainly good. Um, your, your life experience gives you that, but there are many, many people who have not grown through their life that maybe would, would do that confession, but have not experienced that in their life that they stop there. And then they wonder if God can forgive me because of all the bad I've done. Now, you've, you've matured enough in your faith that you know that God has forgiven me. You've lived your baptismal faith, and, and for you it's a knowledge. But there may also be times where you've crossed that line enough that you say, well, I wonder if, you know, when I did. But you've lived experience in your baptismal life that that's not an issue for you today. But there are enough people that do that they need to hear that absolution. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and, and we're going to take that one step further because public confession is a wonderful power statement. For most of us, it, it's, it's all that we need, not that we could use more. But there's also a place where we can say that, that it goes one step further because it may not be for everyone all that you need. There's also a place for private confession, even within our Lutheran church. Um, and, and we should never, never diminish the value of private confession because Satan works on all of us and it doesn't matter whether you're a PK who's, who's lived a, a life in the church or you know, uh, someone new to the faith. Satan will love to get inside your brain and say, how dare you call yourself a Christian? Remember when? Because you. <laughs> you think that you're a Christian and you did that? You think this? You behave that way? And, and you can go to church every Sunday and you can hear God say, in the stead and by command, I forgive your sins. Say, yeah, I know I'm supposed to be forgiven, but he doesn't really know how bad I am. And, and Satan will put those thoughts in your heads and he will call you to question God's grace, because Satan is powerful. He's not all powerful, but he's powerful. And, he'll, and so sometimes public confession is not enough. Does that make sense? And, and that's the beauty of private confession. And so we, we do experience and offer private confession. But remember, private confession is still just shorthand for private confession and absolution. Private confession and absolution is a powerful, powerful tool that God gives to us for the forgiveness of sins. And, and we use that so that you set up a time with your pastor um, and you come in, and, and I use this on a regular basis in, in counseling with people. Um, it, it's probably, I, I don't know if it's 
Uh, it's more than 50% of the time I counsel with individuals or couples. Private confession becomes a part of our time together. Um, that, that we just need to hear God's grace, that, that we experience that. And we do the same thing. We go through the, the confession. And um, the, the value of that is to hear not just the general confession. I've sinned against you, thought, word, and deed. But then we stop and say, what particularly bothers me is, and we are here in the sanctuary, and you're standing before God, just you and God, and I'm usually standing off the side, and you verbalize out loud that which is really burdening your conscience. What bothers me is that I'm addicted to pornography. What bothers me is that I lie to my spouse that I have an anger issue, that I, whatever, that I stole, that I cheated, that I fill in the blank, um, that I don't love my children. And, and we need to say those things out loud. It's not enough just to think of that because you're saying them to God because those are the things that Satan gets inside your head and says, you call yourself a Christian and you still do this. You still hold on to this. And you're just putting that out before the Lord. And this is what's killing me right now. And you lay that before the Lord. Um, and so we confess that. And you're not confessing it to the pastor. You're not confessing it to the priest. You're confessing it to God. The only reason the pastor is in the room is for the second half. So the pastor can, can step in after you've completed whatever is bothering you, the pastor can then say, in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins and specifically that your addiction to pornography was covered by the blood of Jesus, that your lying to your spouse was covered by the, that your anger over whatever was covered and list those specific sins have also been forgiven um, because we need to hear that too not just enough to hear that general announcement of God's grace, but we need the specific announcement of God's forgiveness. Because um, sometimes the general is just not enough, because Satan loves to be inside. So we, we offer both of those things um, as, as part of that confession of solutions, because it's a powerful tool that God uses to cleanse our, our hearts. Now I will tell you that as <coughs> pastor, I use this also a lot in, in family counseling. Um, I use it with families, between siblings, between parents and children, between couples. Um, when, when they're at each other's lives and things aren't going well, um, usually by the time they come to their pastor and, and they want help with this, um, this is not a, the first time we've had a, a, an episode kind of situation. We've been struggling for a long time. Um, and it's, it's built up resentments. And, and the way I describe it is, you know, it's uh, you know, like those DYI. If we're going to do a, a household makeover in your relationship, what's the first thing you do when, uh, before you do, okay, do a makeover? Flip it through the stove. Yeah, you, you got to do the demo day. And this is demo day. We got to get rid of all that old junk. And old junk is my resentments and my angers and my frustrations. And so we will use this as a form of, of demo day and we'll bring both of the parties or sometimes it's more maybe a whole family um, we'll bring them in and we will ask them to say um, we'll do the confession you know I've sinned against your thought word and deed where I particularly sinned against my siblings and I want you to write out when I came to Christmas and I was a jerk or when I you know stormed out of dad's hospital room and, and told you that you were trying to kill him when you wanted to let him go or whatever you said. When I did these things, I sinned against you. Um, and I'm asking God and I'm asking you for forgiveness. And we will do this right in front of the altar. Um, and it's a powerful, powerful thing to communicate. You're not allowed to confess somebody else's sins. I can only confess my own sins. And I've seen this work, not because anything the pastor does, it's because God does the work. 
Now, that doesn't make all the relationships good. All that means is we've just gotten rid of all the junk, and now we can begin building good communication skills, we can begin relationship building, we can do all those things that need to be put in, but you start with that. Does that make sense? But it's God's way of healing relationships. Um, confession of solution is a powerful tool for working our relationships. Um, and, and so it's a great tool and a blessing to us. Um, we do something, um, I just got a letter from Jean and Mary Allison. Uh, I don't know how many know Jean and Mary. They always sat back over there. They very rarely missed a church service. They just moved to Oregon. Um, and they're, did you get a letter from them? Um, they just moved there uh, and got there last week or so. And um, the one thing they just kind of said, told me they got settled in and they're there with their family and their kids. And the one thing they said that we're going to miss most is that Wednesday night service. Because we do that confession absolution service on Wednesday of Holy Week. Um, and they said that's the most powerful service. And they said, if we ever come back, we're coming back for that service. <laughs> um, I told them we're going to put their names on those seats and just uh, have a permanent reserve spot for them when they come back. Um, but the power of hearing God forgive you as an individual is unbelievable. Um, because that's really what the only tool we have, isn't it? is to announce God's grace. And as a pastor, there's nothing more humbling, nothing more humbling than for me, who, who am I to stand in God's presence and to say, Bruce, on behalf of God, I'm telling you, you are forgiven. <laughs> what right do I have to do that? I mean, I, I am the chief of sinners. I, uh, if you can't say that, then uh, as a pastor, then I shouldn't, shouldn't be here. Um, and, and so it, it's a powerful tool that God has given to his church for the grace of God. And, and that's really what the church is about, isn't it? To forgive sins. Now the question I ask is, um, whose sins should not be forgiven? The ones who aren't sorry. How do you know? Forgive me, I'm sorry. So yeah, if they, I mean, sometimes they just tell you, I'm not sorry, you know, and, and you don't know. Um, it's, it's hard. It's hard not to know or to know when somebody is genuinely sorry or not. Um, let, me, let me put it this way. To whom does the right, now, do you as a lay person have the right to forgive somebody else's sins? Yes. Mm -hmm. Really? Yes, I, but <laughs> when I say that, um, just as I would recommend that you go to a tax professional accountant to get your taxes done, I don't really want to be in that position. I would recommend that somebody <laughs> like minister to do that. That's we a good could, answer. We could do it. Can you forgive the sins of your wife? No. No? I don't oh, yeah, okay, the kids do, yes. Yeah. I would say, I would say your wife's sins. You, no, you can't. Did, yeah, um, there, there is a certain um, vein of thought, I don't, I don't hold to this, that says only the pastor should forgive sins. I think that's incorrect. I think we send the, forgive the sins of those who sinned against us. I think as Tyler's also right that um, a general announcement of forgiveness yeah, you have the right to, to announce something just like you have the right to baptize anyone, but that should be under more of an emergency situation, not the standard situation. Because if you forgive somebody their sins and it's, it's, somebody's not forgiven, then you are, you are confirming them in their, their wrongfulness. If somebody is not repentant and you forgive them sins, you're just confirming them in their arrogance, aren't you? And so... You know, you're just, you're giving them tax advice and you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, you know, it's better to left to the professional. But yes, you can, if somebody sins against you, you certainly should forgive them their sins. Absolutely. Great. Uh, I'm going to throw something out here and see where... Okay, time's up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
exactly where I'm going. Thank, Thank you for transitioning. And I think that's an important distinction, and that's where I wanted to kind of wrap this up with. Um, we have a lot of sinfulness in our world, and one of our sinful characteristics is that if somebody knows that you're a Christian, they will use your Christianity to manipulate your um, behavior. You have to forgive me. You're a Christian. Um, if somebody demands forgiveness from you, that's not a sign of repentance. We beg for forgiveness. We don't demand forgiveness. Um, we beg forgiveness from God. We don't demand any forgiveness. Because as soon as you demand it, it becomes a right. A right isn't, you, forgiveness isn't owed to you. It's a privilege that's granted to you by the person you've offended. Um, now, that's, that's something that we can speak kind of in the, in the generic. Um, on the other hand, when somebody has offended you and wounded you, um, repeatedly, a long term, and not somebody who just stubs your toe or you know a, a, a minor slight. Um, there are times when they may never ask for forgiveness. Just their personality, their lack of faith, whatever is, and they're going to continue to be um, unrepentant for their behavior. If you continue to hold that burden of their bad behavior. It can eat and tear you up from inside, and it will leave a black mark on your soul, just as, as uh, um, he said rightly. You may forgive their behavior, but God is the one who's responsible for their eternal forgiveness. And you can say, you know what, I forgive you, but I, God's going to have to forgive your sin. So that's a distinction that I think is worthy of noting. Um, Destroy us. Destroy our faith. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and, and I think we also are like, how, how do you do that? You you, know? It's the forgiveness that belongs that I need for my sake, I need to forgive them. Now, their relationship between them and God, that's to be to, up to them. So they need God's forgiveness. Now I can forgive them. So to, in conclusion then, um, when you have sinned against someone else, we've kind of been offering about offering forgiveness. To whom should you confess your sins? To God. All right, now, to whom, when you have sinned against someone else, to whom should you confess? The person that you've sinned against. Yeah. Not if you feel like it, because yeah. you very rarely feel like it. You know, it's even when you don't feel like it, you should go and, and acknowledge it, right? I need to say, you know, and, and there have been times I've confessed a sin and some said, I didn't, I didn't realize you did. There are times somebody's confessed to me and I said, I, you did what? I didn't notice that. And that's great. But it's for their sake they need to do it. Clear a conscience to feel good. Um, and then if, if you still can't get past it, then you may want to confess to your pastor. Or to your tax professional, as I rightly put it. Right? Um, but first to God and then to those you've sinned against and then... Um, your pastor if necessary. So the, the burden of confession is not in the act of saying what I did wrong or somebody acknowledging us. It's not something. Um, it is in hearing those words of grace and forgiveness. All right. Next week we will try to wrap up. It will maybe take two weeks to finish up on close communion. And then we're going to go back to John. <laughs> we're going to get there, Warren. And I, and I appreciate you kind of reminding us of that. Um, so we're wrapping up our catechism either next week or two weeks, however long it gets through uh, communion. Uh, final part of the six key parts. Let's close with a blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us always. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Have a great day.